This is Musings of the Shy podcast. I'm your host, Rosia Shy. So here we are again, Rosia Shy here, speaking about how Bitcoin is a messy bitch. This is part five. We're now getting into mining. Um, we're going to talk about the nature of mining first before we talk about the Hong Kong agreement and the um, recent agreement that may have been made. There's been a couple of different potential mining agreements as well as mining pools and how they have formed and their effects. So this week, we're going to kind of be devoted towards mining, if you will. Uh, But first off, we need to talk about the nature of mining and its placement in uh, the Bitcoin uh, protocol, into the network, into the space. Mining in general when it comes to a number of different cryptocurrency coins. Um, Eventually, we'll talk about the down the line after this series of episodes. We'll talk about the nature of of the, how different cryptocurrency coins have formed because of the problems with the, the block um, size debate and how there's even coins that are not mined at all in tokens and, and breaking down all that all that information. But right now we're just going to talk about mining. Uh, this is episode 125, part 5 of uh, Bitcoin is a Messy Bitch. And it's called Whistle While We Work. But before we get into discussing mining, the news. This is from Bits Online. New Egg chooses Litecoin as a faster alternative to Bitcoin payments. The, blow get, the blows against Bitcoin just keep coming. This time, major electronic retailer New Egg said it has started looking into Litecoin as the second method of cryptocurrency payments, having accepted Bitcoin since 2014. This article is written by Evan uh, Vagert. Um, this is from May 19, 2017. New Egg goes Litecoin. New Egg revealed on Friday morning that it started research researching Litecoin. Twitter user Aaron Diaz Chavez tweeted to the company asking when they would accept the altcoin. Uh, New Egg later responded telling Chavez that they started looking into Litecoin. And embedded in here is a tweet. Uh, Aaron Diaz Chavez says, New Egg, when can we start seeing Litecoin as a payment option? Bitcoin takes too long and it's too expensive. Uh, New Egg Services replied, we are actually looking into this and seeing if it would be beneficial to incorporate this as a payment method. Uh, Side MK. If New Egg accepts Litecoin, it will represent a significant shift in the way mainstream companies view cryptocurrency. Currently, mainstream businesses generally only accept Bitcoin due to its value and popularity. While these businesses acknowledge the benefits of certain altcoins, they usually state that they do not have plans to accept it. Um, New Egg is not the only company. Um, yours, which was the uh, micropayment uh, content platform, is moving towards uh, a different away from Bitcoin, I believe is looking into Litecoin. Uh, there's a number of other companies that began accepting uh, Litecoin, having not only exclusively accepted Bitcoin and Ethereum and other cryptocurrencies because of the issues of the block block size debate and you know block size and uh, okay. transaction fees associated with Bitcoin. Considering that a number of these merchant businesses are doing transactions below a hundred dollars. So adding a dollar or two dollars I've seen for a transaction to go through, plus they're already um, <clears throat> whatever fees are associated with the payment platform and you know taxes and all that, kind of adds on. Um, even with New Egg, you can get small items below twenty dollars, but it doesn't make sense to spend two dollars for a transaction fee plus all the additional taxes and fees and shipping that you have to um, do. It's just it's cost prohibitive, if you will. However, with the Bitcoin block size issue becoming more serious, New Egg may soon confirm what many Bitcoiners are warned about. The fact that a congested network will result in individuals and businesses turning to other cryptocurrencies for relief. Until recently, Ethereum was the main cryptocurrency reference as a viable alternative to Bitcoin because of the efficient development team and his range of native use beyond cryptocurrency. People suggested that Ethereum could revolutionize all aspects of the economy. Now it seems Litecoin is an emergency real contender. Should Litecoin thank Segwit? Litecoin created by Bitcoin enthusiast Charlie Lee gained, gained renewed interest after his creator announced that he and his development team will support integrating Segwit into the altcoin. In a blog post, Lee said that he wanted to activate Segwit on his altcoin in hopes that his project would serve as an example to the Bitcoin community. If Litecoin can successfully activate Segwit and benefit from it, he said Bitcoin could definitely do the same. The altcoin began its activation of Segwit a few good weeks ago, and at the press time, the upgrade has been fully implemented. In fact, developers have begun working on Litecoin's version of the Lightning Network, one of the many solutions made possible by the upgrade. The Bitcoin developers created the Segwit upgrade as a way to solve the blockchain's transaction malleability problem, an issue that has persisted since the technology's creation. Along with the malleability fix, the upgrades include several other new features 
most nobly scalability solutions that do not require a hard fork. However, Bitcoin has not accepted SegWit because of the dissenters actively blocking its activation. Due to the intense political, economic, and legal debates surrounding the upgrade in the Bitcoin world, the world's miners have failed to form consensus on the upgrade. Instead, they remain torn between SegWit and a series of hard fork proposals brought forth by developers and influencers who believe on-chain scaling is a must for Bitcoin survival. Currently, those opposed to the core's upgrade is supported support Bitcoin Unlimited as a de facto alternative. While both sides of the Bitcoin scalability debate have, le- have legitimate arguments, there seems seemingly irrecyclable iris- iris- <coughs> iris- disagreements have deadlocked the world's largest cryptocurrency. As a result, transaction times have slowed and minor fees have skyrocketed, especially with the increased transaction volume brought about by the Bitcoin price rally. And in the background, altcoins like Litecoin have gained more prominence and support by adopting SegWit. This trend will likely continue until Bitcoin community reaches a compromise, regardless of whether the results involve an on or off chain scaling. And now, um, user um, activated soft fork is uh, the current solution being bantered around, and we'll see where that goes. It's you know, it's you know, it's why we're doing this series. We're going to go step by step, and we'll talk about the malleability issues when we talk about kind of the really nitty gritty technical aspects. Of you know, it's SegWit and Lightning Network, maybe not so much Lightning Network because it's not necessarily has to do completely with um, the upgrading of the block to block size debate. It's more like if the block size were to increase, then you could do Lightning Network. Um, we might talk about Lightning Network at a different point in time. I just want to keep things simple, but we're going to get into Bitcoin Unlimited, we're going to get into the user activated um, soft fork, uh, which is a SegWit. That's how SegWit could be activated. Um, that has to do with you know, BIP uh, 148. So the um, Charlie Lee, the, the, the creator of Litecoin, has uh, 212 Litecoins up for grabs and a Litecoin SegWit crypto puzzle. Um, it hasn't been solved. It's been going on for about, since the activation, so about a week now. Um, there's various hints. You can find it on Twitter if you go to Satoshi Light and I'll in the show notes, but it's a uh, one another one of those crypto puzzles that people really love and were participating in um, doing and breaking. Um, Bitcoin's known for it. Uh, there's been a few different ones from the um, pretty much one of the famous ones is the one where they had like a, a painting or yeah, it was pretty much a painting. And by looking at the painting and breaking it down and going through it, you got hints that would give you the private key to help you unlock the Litecoin solution, if you will. So I have a link in the show notes if you want to participate with it. Um, I suspect, given how long it has taken people to uh, attempt to solve it, that is, it might not be something that's going to be solved so quickly. A lot of the other ones have been solved within, I've seen, like in a couple of days. There's been a few that took a little while, um, but right now, it currently hasn't been solved. And just to keep things simple, that is it for the news. Now we're going to be talking about mining. So miners in mining, you know, miners um, in mining pools, the very act of mining Bitcoin plays a very important part in the protocol, into the network, in the process of creating any cryptocurrency. Well, I shouldn't say any because there are some cryptocurrencies that don't require mining, and we'll talk about them at a different point of time. But specifically speaking of Bitcoin and this issue is miners, this is what they do. And I'm reading from Bitcoin Wicca and then I'm just kind of break down like how the, the process, if you will, or the chain of events that occurred that allow for Bitcoin to come to existence. So mining is the process of adding transaction records to the Bitcoin public ledger of past transaction. This ledger of past transaction is called the blockchain as is a chain of blocks. The blockchain serves to confirm transactions to the rest of the network as having taken place. Bitcoin nodes use a blockchain to distinguish limited, legitimate Bitcoin transactions from attempt to respend coins that have already been spent elsewhere. So when someone sends from their Bitcoin wallet, whether it's purchasing something from Newegg or to another, like a hard wallet or to their friend or tipping, that very act is processed by miners. It's sent out into the network. The network kind of like sends it to the mining pools. They grab it, they process it, and input it into the block. And then as it fills up, the block fills up is one megabyte. As it fills up all the transactions, 
that occur the, 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 in that 10 minute time frame and spits it out that is added to the to the to the blockchain to the to the ledger or the public ledger that bitcoin has and then the bitcoin nodes you know take that information process it and say that's the public ledger that's the new block that has been added to the chain we've read it you can't respin that you can't double spin you can't alter it you can't fake it that's the process and i'm going to continue on and then we'll talk about you know the rewards now mining is mining is intentionally designed to be resource intensive and difficult so the number of blocks found each day by miners remains steady individual blocks must contain a proof of work to be considered valid the proof of work is verified by other bitcoin nodes each time they receive a block bitcoin uses the hash cash proof of work function the primary purpose of mining is to allow Bitcoin nodes to reach a secure, tamper-resistant consensus. Mining is the only mechanism used to introduce Bitcoins into the system. Miners are paid any transaction fees as well as a subsidy of newly created coins. This both serves the purpose of disseminating new coins in a decentralized manner as well as motivating people to provide security for the system. So, there's a transaction fee, not always a transaction fee. There, you can do no fees. It's not going to get processed by the miners. For the longest time, it was being processed by the miners. But you do like a, a transaction fee, and most fees, you know, were like 0 0.0000001, okay? And then it didn't matter if it was a hundred dollars, five hundred dollars, a thousand dollar value of Bitcoin, you know, ten, twelve, fifteen, a hundred Bitcoins. It was going to get processed. As things got get, getting congested, as popularity grew for the Bitcoin currency and those blocks kept getting filled, it became the difficulty rate of finding these blocks, creating these blocks, and getting that block reward, if you will, the, the reward for doing this work and, getting, and gaining those um, Bitcoins became more intense. So miners started incurring some costs, if you will. But at the same time, and this is becoming the issue, is they don't have to process every transaction they can just let it sit out there in what is called the meme pool the, the waiting pool to be processed and that's where we're ha was happening because either someone didn't put the right type of fee if you wanted a, a free bitcoin transaction you're not your your bitcoin transaction is not going to get processed even if you put a dollar fee or two dollar fee in some cases it might still not be processed. So these, these miners are reaping a, a significant reward from these um, transaction fees. And these blocks can get pretty expensive, especially if you have a backlog, if you will. As more and more people want to secure their transaction, they're going to increase the fees to 5, 10, 20, whatever the market can bear to pay the miners to process their transaction, if you will. At the same time, these, these miners are also getting rewarded these coins. So that's pretty much the conundrum or the issue if you will and there's people seeking solutions to you know this one megabyte thing was never supposed to be a permanent fixture in the bitcoin ecosystem it was supposed to have been raised a long time ago in fact bitcoin when it started out didn't have a, a one megabyte limit it was much higher i want to say it was like 32 megabytes or something ridiculously high like that but the network it was getting spam it was getting D, uh, dos attacks so it was lured, lured to prevent that, to prevent um, tampering and breaking in the network and allowing for uh, a gradual grow. And the plan was to raise it over time to fit the needs of the network. That's where the dilemma is. Well, that's the problem. And you have having some bulk on the part of the miners who are reaping quite a bit of benefit here. They're getting the, the, um, the fee for processing the transactions of Bitcoins and they're getting the reward of the, the new coins that they then go put out of the market and sell, if you will. So bit mi mining is also is so, is so called because it resembles the mining of commodities. It requires extrusion and slowly making new currencies available at a rate that resembles the rate at which commodities like gold are mined from the ground. So that's why it's called Bitcoin mining. That's, that's the dilemma that we're facing here and that's the, the important place that miners play or mining pools or mining plays in the Bitcoin network. It secures the network. It's this proof of work function of processing the transactions, uh, doing all that computer and hash work, if you will, a uh, very intense cryptographic uh, processing power, if you will, focusing on uh, processing all the transactions that people are conducting. 
um, collected the fees for doing that. And then because of the difficulty, they might, you know, get the reward of hitting a block of discovering a new block, if you will, that has uh, Bitcoins. And currently right now, the block reward is 12 Bitcoins, which currently right now is trading around as reporting $2,200 is what um, a single Bitcoin is worth, which is... So it's 264k per block reward, which is a split within the mining pool, if you will, of the discovery. You know, there have been, and it's been a very long time where a solo miner has discovered a block reward and, and gained the entire load themselves because they're the ones that found it. But for the most part, it's being split within the pool and disseminate that reward is disseminated in that um, Bitcoin, which are called Coinbase because they're new, they're newly minted coins, they've never been utilized, they're coming straight from the mine, fresh little loaves of bread, if you will, out of the oven, and are sold off of the exchanges. And those actual particular coins, when we talked about fungibility, uh, if the aftermath of the collapse of the Silk Road marketplace, actually have a higher value because they don't have any transaction history. So if you were to get a newly fresh, um, loaf of bread, if you will, a coin base, which is one of the reasons why coin base is named what it is. Um, say for example, maybe it's like 500 extra bucks to get a coin base. So it's like 2,700 bucks and you put it on a, a stick somewhere. But then there's no transaction history because you got it straight from the mining pool, if you will. And, um, or, so without that transaction history, you can eventually utilize that coin and might increase in value over time, depending on how the fungibility issue is addressed in Bitcoin um, might increase in value or might remain the same, but it, I, I think in general, because of the transaction history is non-existent, would increase in value. So you have that occurring, and it's because of their importance. So they do have a significant place in a stronger role than, say, Bitcoin nodes, which are, um, they validate the blockchain. They, they validate that the blocks that the uh, miners are adding, the transactions that occur, have occurred, that there is no double spinning, that someone is not sending the same uh, Bitcoins twice, they're not gumming up the works, there's no fraudulent uh, Bitcoin transactions, they're not creating a fake Bitcoin and sending it out there on the network um, it, because, it, because the miners never validated it, they never put it into a block. Uh, the Bitcoin nodes do that, that's their, their function. Now, other cryptocurrencies have put uh, a greater emphasis on nodes, and there's nodes rewards for running nodes. Nodes have a stronger place in the in the network, more so than just beyond validation, um, make, giving it an equal footing. There's different dynamics, and we'll break that down when we discuss about those other cryptocurrency coins. But currently, right now in the process, it's the miners. You know, they they put all the the Bitcoin transactions that happen. You know, sending your Bitcoin from one person to another to purchase a good, all that transaction is then put into the one megabyte, which is currently what the block size is, um, onto the network, sending it out to the nodes, you know, doing all the hash rate, cramming all the transactions into that one megabyte um, block size, putting it on the blockchain, adding to the blockchain, uh, garnering those fees associated with that uh, one megabyte, um, transaction and in the process you know or randomly they might discover a, a block that has the 20 currently right now 12 uh, bitcoins associated with it and, and guaranteeing that as a reward so miners get the reward for the fees which is the bulk of what they get but when they discover those, those randomized um, very hard very difficult to, to garner and gain uh, even with the, you know there's been there was a period of time where people were capable of targeting to find those block rewards and certain mining pools were very efficient at that um, and then the difficulty and hash rate changed a bit um, gaining those 12 block block uh, bitcoins and gaining that for their pool which is in disseminated right now there's no solo mining and it's mostly pools and we'll talk about them next episode but that is what the process of mining is So continuing with the Bitcoin Wicca, 
um, let's talk about the difficulty, why, why this is so difficult to do and why it's so um, computationally, and, you know, the resources to do it and why Bitcoin mining pools exist. Um, one of it has to do with um, the, the process of in itself and the other has to do with hardware. But right now we're going to talk about the algorithm, if you will, the cryptographic process that creates the transactions and creates the Bitcoin and secures the network. One of the one of the features that really super secures the network, um, along with the nodes, but it begins with the miners. So difficulty, the com the computational difficult problem. Mining a block is difficult because the SHA two five six hash of the block's header must be lower than or equal to the target in order for the block to be accepted by the network. The problem can be simplified for the for the explanation process. The hash of the block must start with a certain number of zeros. The probability of calculating a hash that starts with many zeros is very low. Therefore, are many attempts being made. In order to generate a new hash each round, a nonce is incremented. So, proof of work for more information. Um, so, things it's, it's just very difficult. You have to go through this very intense algorithm process in order for this to work. The difficulty metric. The difficulty is measured at how difficult it is to find a new block compared to the to the easiest it can ever be found. It's recalculated every 2016 blocks to value such that the previous 260 blocks could have been generated in exactly two weeks had everyone been mining at this difficulty. This will yield on average one block every 10 minutes. As more miners join, the rate of block creation will go up. As the rate of block generation goes up, the difficulty to compensate which will push the rate of block creation back down. Any blocks released by malicious miners that do not meet the requalified difficulty target will simply be projected by everyone in the network and thus be worthless. So you can't like kind of gum up the works by saying, oh, I found these blocks, look at all these blocks, block, 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 blocks. They'll be rejected by the network. They'll say, meh, that's not correct. You, you didn't do it the proper way. You didn't use the proper process. And the nodes and other miners and everyone will just poo poo on that. And that has happened. And that's why you have these things, this thing called orphan blocks. We'll still talk at the kind of the end here. So it's very difficult to do. The more miners that get into the game, the more difficult it becomes, the harder it is to get that block reward, if you will. Even if you're collecting those transaction fees, it has to go with the cost of reaching that process of getting that block reward. When a block is discovered, the discoverer may award themselves a certain number of bitcoins, which is agreed upon by everyone in the network. Uh, currently, that is 12 bitcoins, um, and the value will have every 200. 10,000 blocks, uh, which currently, right now, the Bitcoin block reward, um, the next halving, if you will, will not be till June 23rd, 2020. Whew, that's a while. Well, it's three years from now. And that's when it will drop from 12 to 6 Bitcoins. God, how much will 6 Bitcoins be worth then? Uh, when a block is discovered, the discovery may award themselves a certain number of Bitcoins, which is agreed upon by everyone in the network. Currently, this bounty is 20 12. That. Additionally, the miner rewards the fees paid by users sending transaction. The fees is incentive for the miner to include the transaction in their block. In the future, as the number of new Bitcoin miners are allowed to create in each block dwindles, the fees make, make up a much more important percentage of the mining income. So the fees are very important um, because the block reward value is not going to be as much. You're dividing it up six Bitcoins amongst however many um, People might be within the pool or interest in the pool and so you you are going to be very heavily reliant on those fees so that's the kind of software angle of it how it is just a very difficult intense computational process but it didn't always begin that way when Bitcoin first came out <coughs> You could, and people did, and some cryptocurrencies still you can, or even when they first come out, but not so much any longer. You can use your computer, you can use your laptop to do what is called CPU mining. Um, early Bitcoin pilot versions allowed users to use their CPU to mine. The advent of GP mining made CPU mining financially unwise as the hash rate of the network grew to such a degree that the amount of Bitcoins produced by CPU mining became lower than the cost of the power to operate CPU. The option was therefore removed from the Bitcoin Core client user interface. So, when you downloaded the Bitcoin Core 
wallet. You could, through the wallet, through the software, through the wallet, mine on your computer, mine on your laptop. And that's how a good chunk of the very early Bitcoins were produced. It's basically your computer, depending on what kind of computer you had, or laptop, would do the computation through this hardware and produce the results. And people were able to garner and, and gain um, Bitcoin as a reward. And very nominal transaction fees, if there were any transaction fees. This is very early on. I say within the first two years is when you really started seeing, you know, kind of fees really kind of come into play um, within the Bitcoin sphere, if you will, to get, you know, get your transaction there a little bit faster. But for the most part, it was just like the block reward. And I think at the time, what was the time? Let's see, let's travel back in time here. Okay, the initial block reward was 50 Bitcoin. And then it went to 25, and now we're at 12. So in the very beginning, you can say that Bitcoin's mining was very decentralized because anyone, pretty much everyone has a kind of a computer or laptop. I even seen things where people were using <laughs> phones, but they weren't very productive um, or as productive if you were efficient. And that process was was kind of baked in or built in. And Satoshi Nakamoto and the Bitcoin core, core developers knew that that wasn't going to last very long. Now, they did anticipate ASIC, and we'll get into ASIC, but they did realize that someone would eventually find a faster way or more efficient way of making these computations and doing that process. And they were fine with that because it, it helped to cure the the mining, secure the network, and that was the whole point of mining. And it was a belief that if enough people became part of the network and would seek out to participate in a way to prevent what is known as the 51 hash attack. Now, 51 ha uh, percent attack is if someone were to control that much of the hashing power of Bitcoin, they can, in essence, could do double spending. They could break the network, if you will. They could... Um, have such a control of the network with as far as the blockchains go of adding the blocks to to such a point where they can control the game or run the table if you will and anytime any mining pool garnered that hash rate of getting 51 percent people would activate either their what is known as gpu miners and we'll talk about them in a second or any mining gear they had or cpus or they would discontinue their efforts with any particular mining pool and go to a different one to prevent that hashing aspect from happening. Now what this hasn't done and hasn't prevented is the centralization in the sense of a lot of the mining pools are in, are in China and we'll talk about China in the third part of this mining um, series of mining episodes. But that's pretty much basically what it is, is, you know, people would participate to protect their own self-interest. It's all about self-interest, really. That's the whole point of the Bitcoin network protocol. The whole point of Bitcoin is creating your own self-interest. If you are utilizing your own self-interest to create your own personal wealth, having some control of your wealth with a bunch of other group, groups of people doing the same action, but neither one of them had the same type of control of your wealth as, say, the current government or current economic system that we're all residing in. Um, and even if, like, a mining pool or a Bitcoin company has a particular sway within the community, they don't really have control because they no one can directly control um, the network because it's so decentralized. Not even the core uh, Bitcoin developers who have control of it of the um, code, not even they have control of the network, if you will, even though it kind of seems like it with the whole uh, Bitcoin block size debate that's going on right now. So this kind of simplifies uh, what I'm talking about here about the history of Bitcoin mining. This is from Forklog. Um, does that state who wrote the article, uh, the brief history of Bitcoin mining and how it all started? Um, so this came out July 18, 2016, the week after Bitcoin mi mining reward having Forklog decided to compile a short overview of the history of mining methods. Uh, so we went from uh, 25 to 12 last year. 
Generally speaking, Bitcoin mining process is a process of cryptographic calculations. As we know, Bitcoin is mined in blocks, and the more there are generated coins altogether, the smaller is the block size. Initially, a block was just 50 BTC, but the number of mined coins has each 210 blocks. Thus, the reward of each found block also ha has with some peer, uh, periodic periodically. In economic terms, the model AK having is required to control the currency inflation rate. The very process of mining requires computational capacity, time, and process ex and power expense. The longer you mine bitcoins, the more power intensive the mining becomes. The increased speed of genera generated bitcoins is reversibly proportional and it exponentially drops. The total number of coins ever to be mined is 21 million. It will never exceed this number. The process looks as follows, and they have a diagram. In the case of cost, the mine bitcoins exceeds the expense of mining, including cost of electricity and equipment. This kind of activity is economically reasonable. Therefore, as mining difficulty increases, less efficient and economically feasible de devices just leave the industry. At the time of publication, computational difficulty had increased nearly 210 billion times, while the total computational capacity of miners combined compressed upwards of 1.5 million uh, GH hash. So, how it started. The CPU mining, so our laptops, our computers. At the dawn of mining 2009, the new block header hash was calculated with CPU of the common computer, the Intel Core i7, or 909 times had the efficiency of a 33mH uh, machine. So it was not as efficient as what would eventually come. And then when it came was the GPU miners and the first mining farms. Further progress in mining industry shifted towards graphic process units, so your graphic cards, those so specialized graphic cards that if you're part of the PC master race, it allows you to have fantastic um, HK, or not HK, but HD quality 4K graphics going while you're playing um, Grand Theft Auto 5 or Destiny or Overwatch. I'm not sure if those are on PC yet, or, um, or any of those, um, you know, World of Warcraft, any of those intense PC games where you have to have a lot of graphic interface. Um, those type of components if you were building your own computer or really into gaming like pretty much from like 2012 to i would say even up to 2016 um, though it started trying to dip maybe mid 2015 getting your hands on a uh, graphic computer card like that like an nvd or amd or any of those um, companies that specialize in, in computer graphic cards were hard to get by and they were very expensive and the reason for that was everyone was just grabbing two, three, four, five of them, creating a scarcity. Or somewhere up to 10 or 100 or a warehouse of them to create Bitcoin or any of the other cryptocurrencies that eventually would come out into the world, like Litecoin and um, Dogecoin and, and such. So further process of progress in mining industry shifted towards graphic process units. Due to their architect graphic adapters, run cryptographic ca calculations much faster than CPU. Top assemblies of AD, AMD GPU provided efficiencies of around six, 650 to 675 mHs. As it turns out, one could pump up the computational capacity by linking several GPUs together. A platform otherwise referred to as a mini farm, cons farm consisted of a single motherboard, a CPU, or RAM unit, and could host five or six powerful graphic accelerators. Um, there were a while there was people, you know, showing their pictures of their graphic farms or they would show a picture and say hey, I'm having this type of issue what what did I did wrong you know did what did I do wrong and people were helping one another to um, fix their farming unit if you will and then what began to happen and I think really when Satoshi Nakamoto published his paper and produced the initial first protocol I don't think people fully understood or realized how fast the computer market would change or the hardware market for the mining and the calculation. I think I don't think they anticipated it. And this, this is when things started to get a little wonky, if you will. Uh, gate arrays. This approach we, weakest link was the high power consumption of such systems, the uh, competing technology of FPGA or field programmable gate array miners was the first attempt to tackle the problem. Such miners provided nearly five fold advantage in terms of power consumption 
as compared to GPU miners at the high-end solution of the defunct uh, Butterfly Labs based out of Altera FPGA provided efficiency of 2.52 GHs. The FPG mining turned out to be too expensive as compared to GPU mining. Moreover, video cards having exhausted their mining resource may be sold as more profitable prices. And then this is when things really just the game change. ASICs and the arms race. All those two devices became economically feasible for Bitcoin mining after ASIC miners or application specific integrated circuit miners emerge. Their only purpose is to run the cryptographic calculations for mining. Their power efficiency is tenfold higher. Pioneered in this realm was Butterfly Labs, who started accepting pre-orders for miners using their, this technology as early as June 2012. The most powerful of them, the SC Mini Rig, had the efficiency of, of 1,500 GHSs. Due to the increased difficulty and resources intensity of mining, this kind of activity migrated from small farms to data centers capable of setting enormous levels of computational power. Those conditions economically justified Bitcoin mining. So what you began to have is you began to have people investing in warehouses, going into uh, remote locations like in the Icelandic and cold places, uh, Canada, uh, in the northern parts of the United States, uh, anywhere where it was cold so they can utilize uh, these very intense machines that are producing all this type of heat that um, could be cooled and you wouldn't have to have these ACs or cooling units um, around. At the same time, you had people going to, you know, down to Venezuela, uh, Brazil, uh, going to China, where you can basically one-stop shop everything. And uh, we'll explain that in the China, China episode, but basically because China produces the chips, it has um, electricity warehouses, uh, all the resources are right there. Basically, you're just picking up off the shelf, if you will. Uh, that's why a lot of the mining um, pools, and even to some extent, a lot of the exchanges started going toward to China. So with that, basically, the individual was pretty much out of the game. You would have to pull your resources, already have a significant amount of economic wealth to create a warehouse to purchase all this gear to get the people in place to wire everything to make sure it's safe DOS attacks all that to make it happen so a lot of people began to be priced out and then you have cloud mining uh, uh, the thing about cloud mining is it just there's a lot of scams associated with it and there's not enough control I would say that people have when it comes to cloud mining but it's something that's out there in the marketplace if you will in the discourse of bitcoin mining history it'd be unfair to admit the new mining method i.e cloud mining which uses dedicated cloud services to mine cryptocurrency this method's advantages include an absence of any need to buy expensive equipment pay for electricity or spend your own time to just miners having paid for serving and the fee set by your host company you may use the service still there are risks related to non-payment of your revenue and then what you have is the hacking method, where you have some malwares that go out there where they utilize um, uh, either people's servers, um, computers, phones to do this. Uh, the other quite popular in some narrow professional circles, the type of cryptocurrency mining is mining using devices of other people. All that malicious agents need to launch as a mining facility is to own a botnet and have some sort of specialized malware program to secretly penetrate the company computers of users in the botnet. In some cases, having the software and paying for malware installation onto existing botnets is fair enough as the prices of such shady servers usually do not cost much. Our services usually don't cost much. An attacker gets a very small computer, computer power from each individual user that can be just a tiny fraction of a decent mining farm. For instance, in 2014, the unknown hacker used a vulnerability in uh, Synology servers and gained about $200,000 in, Doge, in Dogecoin. There are some other cases known when the same cryptocurrency was mined via several millions of mobile devices. The reason is always the same. Hackers were better at reading the native software code than the producer's security team and became the first to discover its holes. So beware, maybe you're already part of someone's farm. And that's where the article ends. Um, I also heard uh, people very early on making posts to where they were IT people, um, where they would um, utilize... Um, their company's computers at night to run um, mining. So they would mine off of their employer's um, computers, if you will. And even some places they were like the university system 
our school networks and gain or garner quite early on when CPU mining was a thing, um, quite a bit of Bitcoin, if you will, fairly early on in the process. So that is something that also occurred. So we're going to talk about meme pools and then we're going to cover a couple more things and just wrap it up. I just want to keep things pretty basic because then we're going to talk about the mining pools and the business of that and then the, the third episode of this miners week if you will will deal with the uh, just China in general and the Hong Kong agreement so a meme poll this is from the Merkel what is a Bitcoin meme poll by JP uh, Buntix the Bitcoin meme poll is a collection of all transactions waiting to receive a network confir- confirmation Every time a Bitcoin transaction is broadcast to the network, it takes an average of 10 minutes before it receives the first tran- first confirmation. However, depending on how many pending transactions there are in the mean pool at any given time, that 10 minute pool window can be larger. Over the past few months, there have been multiple mean pool incidents causing significant transaction confirmation delays. So yeah, I recently had this where my transaction was kicked out of the mean pool because I did set the fee, the transaction fee, high enough for my payment to go through and a lot of other people have had this same similar issue there's other been other issues where their their pending transactions has been waiting 24 to 48 and i've even gone heard as high as three days to get confirmation to be picked up by the miners to be confirmed um and then it hadn't been like quite kicked out it was still like stuck if you want transit so a closer look at the Bitcoin meme pool. The concept of the Bitcoin meme pool is not all that difficult to grasp. Every time a new Bitcoin transaction is valid by the network, will automatically add to the meme pool, where it waits confirmation from miners. Once a miner picks up that transaction in question for inclusion in the next block, it will automatically receive its first confirmation. Each node has its own meme pool and can set the preferred size. When a new block is broadcast to the network, each node removes the transactions that are in the meme pool that have been confirmed, so they get pushed out and are acknowledged of being in the blockchain. Getting that transaction picked up by the Bitcoin miners can be quite challenging, though. Miners prioritize validated, unconfirmed meme pool transactions based on their individual mining fees. Those mining fees are distributed to miners as a bonus for their efforts in solving the next block on the Bitcoin network. Users who include a higher transaction fee will have their Bitcoin transfers picked up quicker compared to those who have a low transaction fee. So if you have zero, forget about it. Bitcoin meme pool is a large collection of network transactions waited, waiting to be confirmed. However, similar to any pool containing a lot of data, there are also so many transactions that can, can be kept in pending until a backlog is created. In most cases, the Bitcoin meme pool contains a relatively small number of unconfirmed transactions, which is not an issue. Unfortunately, the backlog can occur over out of nowhere. This makes the meme pool the effective bottleneck of the Bitcoin ecosystem as a whole. Faster transactions are prioritized and allow a lot of people prefer to pay very small fees. Should the rate of the mining new Bitcoin blocks decrease for some reason, those low, lower fee transactions will face even larger delays. It is not uncommon to experience a meme pool backlog when there are more incoming transactions compared to transfers picked up by miners. It is not difficult to determine when and if the the mean pool can cause a transaction confirmation day. As long as it, the mean pool size remains well below the one um, megabyte mark, there's no delay whatsoever. Any increase in size will indicate the average transaction confirmation time will take X amount of blocks in mind to the network. For example, a 20 megabyte mean pool size will mean a low fee transaction will take an average of 20 mine blocks to receive their first network confirmation. For the time being, there's only one viable way Bitcoin users can bypass any mean pool issues. Include a higher transaction fee is not a popular choice, yet it's the best way to circumvent a mean pool backlog. And if the blocks contain more transactions than right now, mean pool issues will continue to occur over time. Moreover, people flooding the Bitcoin network with zero fee or small transactions can cause quite the mean pool. Back, backlog as well. Higher transaction fees will always be, always, uh, be prioritized. That much is certain. So this is where people say that you know the network is getting spammed because people are putting zero fees or very small transactions into the uh, main pool for like you know five ten dollar transactions if you will, and they're not being picked up by by the miners. It is causing a bit of a backlog. Um, there's even a um, a site that keeps track of this. So right now there is 155k and climbing of unconfirmed transactions as of recording of this um, episode. 
which makes the total fees around 175k waiting with the size being uh in kilobytes 107k plus uh in kilobytes waiting to be uh put in and transactions are 3.7 a second so you're having these these issues these backlogs if you will a lot of it's these transactions are contained in America, but not exclusively. You can look on the blockchain info. They keep track of this. There's a couple other sites that do as well. Um, let's see. They can even tell you what countries these transactions are occurring. You see a lot of congestion in the U.S. Europe is flooded, and then you have these outliers like Saudi Arabia. China, South Korea, Japan is picking up, Russia, um, let's see, South America a little bit, uh, South Africa, a couple other, not so much Africa. Um, I would like to see the continent of Africa getting more penetration with this, you know, Nigeria, Kenya, and Ghana being picked up, but um, spreading out a little bit more because I think, you know, there is some in Egypt uh, the Sudan a little bit, something for a while there, Tunisia, uh, Morocco, built around the tourist industry, but I haven't seen any news about that. That was like a couple years ago. But I would love to see this continent more so, like South America and Africa, are, um, those two regions of the world would significantly benefit from the cryptocurrency space, if you will. So this is why people want to see an increase in the block size, because if you have an increase in the block size, then you wouldn't have this backlog and you can ha start having you know this the smaller fees and zero transaction fees again if you will now some people still feel that's not still not economically feasible if you will miners don't want to do like ten, two megabytes because that'd be too much and then there are those who say that the nodes uh, that have to download like the bitcoin ledger and pub public ledger and maintain it it will be too large for people to be able to run a full node if you will and we'll get into that as we get towards more into the technical aspects of it. Uh, but that's some of the pushback on the miners in is for some of them uh, raising the the megabyte size limit. Their their concerns is economical about the fees, about having to do more computations if it's two megabytes, that's more work, and things of that nature, if you will. And then there's just a little funny thing right here where we have a blockbounties.info. We have a bounty out there uh, for big block bounties uh, with 282.060 bitcoins for a total of 600,012k uh, uh, for the block size reward. And what is this? Uh, for more than a year now, debate has been ongoing on how to best scale the bitcoin blockchain. Some wish to simplify, increase the arbitrary set of one megabyte block size limit. Others claim doing so could be dangerous. Many say Bitcoin miners don't have any financial incentive to try something so bold. Well, here's the financial incentive. Free money for any miner who takes the first step to mining big blocks. And so someone has created a transaction pool, if you will, for this. And this started 19 days ago. So how does it work? Any miner who creates a big Bitcoin block larger than one megabyte risks being ignored by the rest of the network and losing their income for the block in the process. On May 3rd, 2017, a one megabyte transaction was published under the title Say the Chain, which pays almost 274 Bitcoin to any miner who includes it in a block. Doing so would force the block size to exceed the one megabyte limit. However, so the incentive needs to be quite large, and any miner who accepts the challenge needs to be creative in how they encourage other miners to follow the lead. It's possible to create additional transaction bounties that provide an additional reward that is only valid after the save the chain transaction has been included in the blockchain. The site facilitates the creation and publish of those, these additional bounties using the funds of Bitcoin enthusiasts who want to see Bitcoin scale. If you're interested in joining the cause, click here to get started. So we'll see. It's, and that's a lot of Bitcoin. That's a lot of money for to claim this bounty um, for people to to do this, for miners to do this, if you will, to get this transaction out there, to get the process going, and if you will. And then I have a link in the show notes to the 21 companies that control Bitcoin. A lot of it has to do, and we've read already from a number of the, part of this article about the Bitcoin businesses, but a number of the Bitcoin mining pools are in here, and we're going to discuss them in detail um, the following episode, but I just wanted to include just a little snippet of what the next episode is going to be about here in the show notes. 
So basically, to sum things up, when Bitcoin started out initially with mining, you could mine through the, the initial Bitcoin Core protocol software, the wallet that allowed you to have to hold your Bitcoin, to run a full node, to have that wallet, to have the public ledger, to participate in the network. You got the whole kit kaboom. You can mine, you have the public ledger, you can have your coins uh, send and receive all in this little core package. And then as time went on, the, the mining became more difficult as CPU mining was no longer the option. And the dream of a very decentralized everything wouldn't quite happen as more specialized mining equipment came out with you know first GPUs, then a different form of GPU, and then you had the specialized ASIC mining. And then you had the formation of pools with the ASIC minings where people that either already had a significant amount of wealth were able to get investment, created warehouses, and um, cobbled together all the different mining machines, had the people and the resources to do mining full-time year-round in different locales around the world, primarily in China, but not as closely as such. And miners in general, why they are important to the network is they validate and secure the network itself. They, they process the transactions of Bitcoins being sent. They're rewarded in the Bitcoin fees that people add to their transaction, whether it be you know, 0 0.001 or a dollar or two dollars or nothing, so they don't get a reward from zero transaction uh, fees of Bitcoin being sent. But they're also rewarded with the block reward, where they receive currently at this time 12 Bitcoins for doing all this um, mathematical intense computation. So they get 12 Bitcoins plus minor mining fees split amongst their investors in, in the mining pool, if you will. And currently, because the, the block size is one megabyte, you have a backlog in the mean pool, you have a prior uh, peripheral treatment going towards or priority given to the economic incentive of going after transaction that actually has a fee attached it, but a higher fee, whether it be a dollar, dollar fifty, or two dollars to process that fee. Now, when you're sitting at a thousand, two thousand, I think again, as a recording of this episode, Bitcoin one Bitcoin is worth uh, $2,200. Uh, $2 is not much. But when you're trying to do the basic and you know transaction, when the Bitcoin is be, was touted out as the internet of money, and you're trying to buy you know coffee, you're trying to buy you know a game, um, some digital software, uh, any of those type of activities. If you want to pay a content creator or tip somebody. Adding a $2 transaction fee to a uh, dollar or 5 or $20 purchase is significant. Plus, any additional fees you already have to pay as far as you know, tra uh, taxes or uh, shipping and stuff like that, you have to incorporate it. And it's, it's, it's not allowing for potentially the dream that many had where we had the, what is considered the Internet of Money to come into existence. And this is you know another component into the whole... Bitcoin block size debate where you have the miners kind of pushing back because right now they're kind of in a nice sweet spot where you know they're getting the, the 12 Bitcoin uh, block size reward but they're getting these higher transaction fees because uh, due to the network effect of the popularity of Bitcoin and so many transactions being sent out there they're able to scoop up a lot more money than perhaps previously even considered so there's that incentive on their part is not to really raise, you know, the block size or add SegWit or any other changes to the protocol that doesn't benefit them economically. And so we have that particular issue. So next episode, we'll talk about um, mining pools and the business of mining, if you will. And then the third episode will be about um, China, the Hong Kong agreement and a couple other agreements that have had have happened concerning um, the changing of the block size, if you will. So that is it for now. Uh, thank you very much for listening. And until next time. Thank you for listening. Please rate and review either through iTunes or Stitchers or any of the podcasting apps that you're currently using to listen to this show. Thank you. And until next time. This has been a Herosha Shine Space Odyssey Network production.